Hello, everybody. Today I have in the studio Eric Paul Loya. Woo! Is that right? Yes, you did. Good job. He is the executive director of the FSC, which is the Free Speech Coalition, which is a very, very important and integral part of the adult community. And he's here to teach all of us so much about what's going on in the politics behind porn, what's going on with testing. Um, I have a ton of questions for him because I'm not as well versed in these topics as I should be. And um, you're just you're just going to teach us so much today. I'm so excited. Me too. Good I'm, morning. I'm gonna I'm gonna come out of here and I'm gonna be so knowledgeable. <laughs> I think you already are. Oh, I don't know about that. You're, okay. I don't know about that. We can do a quiz. Oh no! What, well, it depends on what the quiz is about. <laughs> I was talking to um, my boyfriend last night about like how I just don't know anything, and how like I I just I know so much about porn, right? Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I need to listen to, like more science podcasts or. I don't know if I want to listen to more about politics because that's just depressing, but I just want to expand my knowledge because I just feel like I just constantly live in this world of just regurgitating like porn, penis, vagina, cum. Like I know everything about porn, but I just feel like I'm losing, I don't know, I'm losing my knowledge of, of the world. It's uh, I used to be smart and I just got dumb. I, no, I don't think you're dumb. I think you're just trying to stay sane in these insane times. Yeah. It definitely is insane times. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your background. Um, so you said my last name, right? Loya. So yes. I'm uh, I'm an immigrant from East Germany, so I grew up behind the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, I moved to the United States in 2013. I've worked in HIV policy, legislation, advocacy, and prevention care for about 14 years. Wow. Um, that's also funny enough how I actually got into the industry because I felt that there were so many unfair attacks levied against the adult film industry mm-hmm. where, where I just thought that it just sounded unreal and it sounded uh, like energy put into the wrong corner. Right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I uh, became the director of sexual health and advocacy for kink.com back in 2014, stayed with them for a good two years, and then joined uh, joined the FSC as the executive director. Um, I'm also a, super, a board of supervisor appointed uh, commissioner on the LA County HIV Commission. Mm-hmm. So um, completely unrelated to my day job, um, I also, uh, so that includes allocating funds that come from the federal government to with the different communities impacted by HIV um, and trying to prevent impact with HIV or by HIV. Um, and obviously, I'll, I won't be speaking in that role because that's not my place. But mm-hmm. um, but I'm just to sort of explain some of my background and my knowledge. So I've worked in policy for a good eight years. Okay. So tell me a little <laughs> bit about your beginnings at Kink. So what was your role there again? So I was the Director of Sexual Health and Advocacy. Okay, so why did what is a... Um, a pretty hardcore S and M porn website. Why did they need that role? So I think a lot of people always uh, assume that the porn industry is this weird, greasy, dirty, you know, bald old guy with the gold chain and the dirty wife beater shirt mm-hmm. um, uh, industry, and that's really not it. So King dot com is, I think, especially BDSM and uh, leather porn, um, <clears throat> where the sex requires so much more conversation between the partners that are involved. It requires so much more negotiation of consent and sort of active communication, they have a very strong and always had a very strong sort of dedication towards sexual health and making sure that people are educated. So um, at the time, I was Mr. Los Angeles Leather 2014. Which is so awesome. I had a sash. (laughs) (laughs) Was it a leather sash? Totally a leather (laughs) sash. It was like a hand down. There was like names on the back of all the people that had it previously. Oh, that's amazing. It's very cute. I was very sad when I had to give it away. I'm like, oh, this compliments my outfit so well. (laughs) Um, uh, I actually had a picture taken with the then mayor, um, Ed Lee, of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Um, We were both at an official event, and uh, I was wearing my sash, and we took a picture together, and everybody was kind of (laughs) like, so anyways... um, so that's kind of how I started at Kink.com, and then they uh, they financed uh, uh, travel for me uh, all over the U.S. Uh, uh, and Canada and some parts of the EU to talk about pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is a daily pill that you can take to that's prevent HIV. Prep, correct? Correct. Okay. So it's covered by your insurance. It's been approved by the FDA in 2012, and um, 
as HIV is a continuously important topic within the industry, which rightly so. Um, it, it's part of sexual health. Uh, it was important to them to sort of be able to um, be a voice that spreads good knowledge, especially as the AIDS Healthcare Foundation was attacking pre-exposure prophylaxis so mm. much, which is now understood to be literally the most important um, prevention tool in the HIV prevention toolbox. So can you explain a little bit about how it works? Doesn't it um, help prevent you from contracting HIV from somebody who has it, right? Correct. So um, uh, so the way that pre-exposure prophylaxis works, the easiest way to explain it to any of your female listeners is mm. literally it's birth control for HIV. Mm, okay. um, so you take a pill in advance. That pill maintains a drug level in your body. Um, it's not dangerous. Um, obviously, it can have side effects, but those are very minimal. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, and as that drug level is maintained, should HIV ever enter your bloodstream, it uh, to a 99% certainty will not be able to infect your body because it can't do the biological things it needs to do in order to like infect your body. Interesting. So it's a, it's a blocker. And um, we've had medications like this for a very long time. So the other one that people should know is post-exposure prophylaxis, which is a drug uh, regimen that you can take with uh, starting within 72 hours after the potential exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and that basically leads to, um, it, it has the same effect. It blocks HIV from replicating in your body and therefore it stops it from infecting your body. And um, all of that is obviously based around um, if you are having condomless intercourse with somebody who uh, who who might who you might not be aware of their status mm -hmm. um it could be that that person has hiv but just because a person is living with hiv also doesn't mean that they carry an infectious viral load so right. that's the other part where hiv com becomes complicated but because it, it simply becomes complicated because we have so much good knowledge about it so when somebody that's living with hiv takes medication they can basically uh reduce the virus in their bloodstream to so little that it can't infect somebody else so and that's called called uh, U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible. It's referred to as TASP treatments, as prevention. So it's kind of, as you will hear, um, I've been doing this for 14 years, so I'm very passionate about it because yeah. it could help us really end the HIV epidemic. That's so, It's so crazy how incredibly <laughs> far it's become because I was talking to my parents and mm -hmm. the HIV epidemic kind of began you know, back when they were still shooting adult movies. Mm -hmm. And when I was a little girl, um, you know, my parents, of their own accord, had a, when they were casting um, actors for a movie, they had a blood truck come to our house. Because mm -hmm. so my parents ran um, their office out of the guest house behind the main house. And they were testing um, actors that they were considering casting in the movie to see to make sure they didn't have HIV before they cast them in the movie. But the whole thing just freaked my mom out so much that I, that's actually what one of the main catalysts was she stopped doing movies and just went to like doing back to doing magazines. Because back then when you were shooting magazines, you didn't shoot penetration. Yeah. Because the magazines were distributed over so many different in so many different states and in Canada and different places. And different the requirements of nudity were so different. Exactly. And the internet hadn't come along, so there wasn't a free for all with, you know, all of that. But that's yeah. literally what like kind of drove my parents out of directing movies. My mom Interesting. just was like So your parents literally started the pass system. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> Industry uh, yeah. standard testing started yeah, at yeah. Randall's family. I know. Home. You know, my mom just uh yeah, they just you know felt it was their responsibility to yeah. to test the people, but then it just became I think too complicated and probably too costly and yeah. just too scary. Yeah. Well, and then window periods change. So, like mm -hmm. back in the day, we had different tests that, like you know, you could have an infection, but it wouldn't be detected for six months. Right. Um, exactly. So, like, why are we testing? Like, obviously, good because risk reduction, no matter what. But now, uh, for example, within the PASS system, which is the industry standard testing protocol that FSC mm -hmm. operates, um, so it's a database as well as a testing protocol. Um, uh, we require a, what is called an HIV RNA qualitative test, which basically can detect HIV as early as seven days. Technically as early as three days, but reliably as early as seven. Right. So for those <clears throat> so of you... We can dive into those more. Right. Yeah. Because I, I do. I definitely want to talk about um, the past system. I had Susie Q on mm -hmm. uh, a little while ago and we talked about it then and that was, that was really helpful because, you know, there's a huge public misconception that everybody in the adult industry is dirty and it, STDs are rampant. Yeah. Um, and they don't understand the HIV testing process. And especially when, you know, Prop 60 came up, 
people were saying, well, even though you're testing for HIV, there's still like this huge window and you can't test for it. And I think they were, people were still quoting that six month window, mm-hmm. but um, it's changed quite a bit now. Yes. Yeah, we we had a we had to do a lot of public education during Proposition 60. Mm. So for the listeners um, uh, that may not be uh, aware, in 2016 there was a state ballot initiative. Um, so California is one of those states where citizens or residents in the state can propose a law, mm-hmm. and if they get enough signatures for it, then they can put it onto the ballot for an election year. Which then means that all people in the state that are eligible to vote will have to vote on it. So that's that's the state ballot proposition in, in a nutshell. But um, what was put on the ballot was uh, widely referred to as the condom mandate mm. for the adult industry. And so what we had to um, educate the public about is that condoms are a good option when you're having sex for like five to ten minutes. Mm. But after that, you know, um, depending on what lubricant you use, um, how big the phallus is. The, can I say D-I-C? You can say dick, yeah. Yay! You can um, totally swear, it's not a problem. <laughs> I love this show. Um, <laughs> free speech. So depending on how big the dick is, etc. So there's lots of different impacts that can uh, could potentially cause a little microabrasions in the, in the uh, receptive or in the in the bottom partner, so to speak. So whether it's anal or vaginal or right. wherever. So there's lots of other things that fly into why sexual health is more diverse than just here, put a condom on. Right. Um, exactly. Especially in porn. Especially in porn. And <clears throat> because you're right, first of all, the time. And then sometimes guys struggle with um performing with yeah. a condom on. So mm-hmm. that can actually make the scene go longer. Yeah. Which means that the girl has to deal with the potential for these abrasions longer. Yeah. And um, I know quite a few girls who, you know, have said that it's definitely like made them really sore the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it just, uh, and also, I mean, the obvious, it takes away the feeling of the fantasy, yeah. which, you know, some people don't like. Some people think it's well, fine. And, I know. And uh, during Prop 60, the other thing that we had to combat was this whole rhetoric that you just said, you know, people presume that the adult industry is dirty. And so AIDS Healthcare Foundation actually went out of their way to try and tell the public um, that porn producers, uh, porn performers carry diseases into the general public. How much money did they, <laughs> didn't they sink into their... Uh, like over six million. Over six million. And we had like 200... 50,000. Yeah. <laughs> it was a huge difference. It was so, like insanely unfair. And then there yeah. was this in, there was uh this um big question as to why Michael Weinstein was spending so much donated money mm-hmm. against like attacking such a small part of the population who yeah. was self-regulating yeah. anyhow. Yeah, and I think a lot of that has to do with how the general public sees sex in the mm. United States. I mean, we, we're the only Western country that has a teenage pregnancy rate of above 16. Mm-hmm. Um, at the worst rates that I've seen, it was 40 per 1,000 young girls under the age of 18. Um, we have rampant HIV infection rates in young adults. We don't have comprehensive sexual health education in schools. And so the easy target is, oh, look at this population of like 10,000 people in the United States that do sex on film. So obviously it's all their fault Mm -hmm. and they're too small to defend themselves. And Mm -hmm. I think what was really powerful about 2016 and and Prop 60 and the battle that we waged, um, I was the campaign manager on it, um, was really how everybody came together. So it was no single person's effort. It was really a group effort and everybody spoke out for themselves. And I think the, the message that rang loud and clear is that workers in the state of California should have the right to control what happens to their bodies. It shouldn't be government regulated. And um, that uh, especially in uh, an sexual environment, consent is important and that whoever person's body it is, it is their choice. Mm-hmm. Um, so our body, our choice, or our bodies, our choices uh, was part of our slogan. And so I think it really permeated the industry as well as the general public. In the end, we, with our little tiny meager budget, uh, we were able to score endorsements by the Democrats, Republicans, and Libertarians, which is very rare yeah, that yeah. they all agree on something. Yeah. So we were a little shocked, but it was great. Um, and in the end, we've won with... Um, um, I think it was over 8% percentage points throughout the state mm-hmm. and over a million votes, considering that we had no budget. 
Right, right, right. Like right. no budget. Right. The industry was uh, we we reached out to industry companies. Uh, they produced our our videos, um, donated their time. So we you know we filed all of that for them, um, and uh, and that's how we build our campaign videos. Um, I think the thing that we spent the most money on was robocalls. Mm. We spent about a hundred thousand dollars on sort of targeting key constituencies and key areas. And um, uh, when we saw the numbers come back from Los Angeles County, and Los Angeles County was kind of 50-50, we knew we had a chance. Okay. So election night was horrifying. <laughs> no, I'm a little bit confused because didn't Prop 60 pass? No. It did not pass. No, we won. What? Something passed before, before that. that. <clears throat> so that was Measure B, and that was 2012. Measure B. Okay, that's, that's what That's only L.A. County. I'm getting those two confused. Okay, yeah, thank yeah. you. I told you. You I are more know. knowledgeable than you give yourself credit. You know it. You just need to put it in the right box. <laughs> okay, so Measure B was what passed. So, yeah, Measure B is basically a smaller version of Proposition 60, and it passed in L.A. County in 2012. So right. first there was a city ordinance. The city was really uncomfortable with it. AHF kept pushing. And then the 2012 rhetoric was was just really poor mm-hmm. um, and LA County totally went for it and mm-hmm. uh, that's part of the reason why in LA County now if you want to produce an adult film you have to register it with LA Film you have to register it with the Department of Public Health mm-hmm. you have to pay fees and fines for about $2000 mm-hmm. so it just it destroys um, the ability for uh, performers to basically work with each other mm-hmm. uh, uh, within the county and it and it creates a really dangerous underground cottage industry mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is exactly what we warned everybody about in Prop 60. And funny enough, during Prop 60, everybody listened. But during Prop uh, during Measure B in 2012, they just didn't. I think, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like we didn't really have our shit together back then. And I think it once that... It was a that, very different message. Yeah. And I think also once that passed, people realized, like, we're kind of screwed. Because, yeah, uh, Prop 60 was when... You know, it was incredible the way everybody came together. I've kind yeah. of never really seen the adult industry come together mm-hmm. that way. The adult industry has definitely been kind of disjointed over the years and not very organized. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because, you know, it's a lot of people who are kind of coming in from different areas. And it's like, I don't know, it's almost like misfits a little bit. Well, and I think back in the 80s mm-hmm. or um, or even earlier than that, what we had is we we didn't have the internet, as you said yourself. Right. So you had to come together. You had to meet. Right. You had to produce. We didn't have webcams. We didn't have clips for sale. Mm-hmm. We produced VHS movies and mm-hmm. shipped them in like nondescript envelopes all over right. everywhere. So it was a very different thing. And so what we've, what we've, uh, what FSC has always said, and FSC has been around since, um, since 1990. 91. Mm-hmm. So we're 27 years old now. Um, uh, what we've always said is that there is danger when our community gets so spread apart. Mm-hmm. But um, we're also not opposing any of the um, amazing technological advances that the industry is bringing forward. I mean, yeah. just look at platforms like Just for Fans, OnlyFans, the webcam industry. Mm-hmm. Um, they're doing incredible things, Chatterbait, etc. So really put the power back in the performers' hands, and I love that. Yeah, so and that's so in uh, during Measure B, the rhetoric of the uh, campaign was actually that um, Measure B would cost the porn industry too much money, so they would go bankrupt. And that wasn't really a message that Los Angelinos were feeling passionate about. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't feel compassion towards the adult film industry. Mm-hmm. But in but in 2016, during Prop 60, my goal was to really highlight the individuals in the industry, to mm-hmm. highlight how empowering adult film actually is to women. Mm-hmm. I'm a gay man. Yeah. Um, but uh, to women, to basically be able to say yes, no, yes, no, right. and have that absolute control is something that always fascinated me and right. something that I felt was something that needed to be elevated. Mm-hmm. So during Prop 60, we actually made it a very clear stance. We even have, uh, uh, if you think about it, we have webcam performers that are teachers that work with their partners because they don't make enough money. Mm -hmm. So now the state wants to regulate how that married couple has sex with each other just because it's on film. Yeah, That just sounds strange. Yeah, you know, and it's funny, that really played out in in my own life because I used to host a show for Playboy TV called Adult Mm -hmm. Film School. And I remember when we did that whole... um, when we went to Cal, when we flew to Kalosha. Kalosha, where did we go? Sacramento? Oh, they're all over the place. Where did Walnut we go? Creek where, where is the everybody, cutest place. Yeah, that's where we, that's where like the whole adult industry yeah. went and everyone like stood in line and went and spoke mm-hmm. in front of Kalosha. And I remember I talked about this because 
the show is um, real life couples mm-hmm. getting a professional sex tape made. Mm-hmm. And because it was Playboy, they play by all the rules, they get the permits, they get all that stuff. So the first season we shot in LA and we used condoms because that was the law. And the fail rate was so high because you've got you know, specifically, we had to get people that had never had sex on film before, you know, mm-hmm. and it is not an easy thing to do. It's very intimidating. Mm-hmm. And we were getting real life couples. We were getting husband and wives who've been married for 13 years, have three kids. They haven't used condoms in all that time. And then yeah. all of a sudden, not only are we going to make you have sure. sex on film, we're going to make you wear a condom <laughs> with your wife yeah. who you don't wear a condom with in your regular life because the government said so. And they were like, huh? So we, so the guys had a real, I mean, it's already a struggle. Yeah. With the condom, it was yeah. even more of a struggle. So, like, it was so painful to shoot these scenes, and so many of the guys couldn't perform, and it was humiliating for them. Mm-hmm. And, like, the, I mean, it, I just felt like I was crushing dreams. Well, and then right. the head starts spinning, and oh, then you get yeah. insecure about Absolutely. it, and then you're like, oh my God. I almost wondered, like, how many, like, couples split up after they, like, <laughs> I just felt like it was so. So, anyways, when we did season two, they specifically moved the entire operation to Austin to mm-hmm. avoid the condom rule. Yep. So, we took all these jobs out of LA and moved it to Austin yeah. because the government was making real life couples yeah. wear condoms because it was on film and it was just it was just one of those cases where it was so clear to me yeah. that this law is not working. Well, and I think I think the other thing that we saw during Prop 60 Kalosha and uh, and some other laws that were fighting around the United States like the porn is a public health crisis rhetoric that President right. Trump endorsed. Right. Um, which is Hilarious. Yeah. Because, considering who he is. Yeah, considering that we're the public health crisis, but not the lack of access to health care. I mean, I, I could go on about yeah. this for an hour. But um, so what we also saw is that <clears throat> the industry hasn't done a really great job in explaining who we are. Right. So a lot of legislators, uh, elected officials, regulators, they have to make assumptions based on sort of what they've heard or seen. Mm. And Boogie Nights is just not a representative feature of who right. our industry is anymore. Right. And um, when we then look at stuff like Rashida Jones' uh, Hot Girls Wanted, which is also not very representative, it becomes really dangerous to for people to make assumptions about us. And so I think um, when I joined FSC uh, in 2016, early 2016, was right dumped into both of these battles. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Kalosha happened 19 days after I joined. Um, luckily, I'd been working on, reg- on the regulatory side for a very long time before that, so I knew what I was doing. But um, what uh, what we really found is that sitting down with a regulator and legislator and sort of just bluntly answering any question that they have and taking no offense mm. and highlighting why certain things are a lot more complicated than they seem on the face mm. um, uh, has really changed and helped sort of set the tone for uh, a legislative and regulatory environment that's open to listening. Um, uh, it's very few legislators and regulators that really think that we're the issue. I think the bigger issue is really just that we haven't communicated well, which is part of because we're a fantasy industry. Mm-hmm. We produce entertainment. We don't want our viewers to have to deal with the mundane behind the scenes, like things that destroy that fantasy right. because then that product becomes sort of worthless almost. So it's that balance that needs to be struck. It's so funny that you say that and it's absolutely so true because I always joke with people. I'm like, you know, people are like, oh, I want to come work for you. And I'm like, do you like porn? Do you, are you into porn? They're like, yeah, I love porn. I'm like, then don't, you, work here. don't come work for me because it will ruin it for you. I can't watch any porn anymore oh, no, because I know everybody. I. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, this is not This is. Not I know okay. everyone. I like know that location. I know <laughs> yeah. what that owner's like. I know that like they're not allowed to work on that couch. Oh my God, you're not supposed to fuck on that couch. What are you doing? <laughs> he's, if he finds out, he's going to kill you. I I Why are you his, not allowed to work on a couch? Well, because uh, certain... It's like their like, favorite Yeah, furniture. exactly. Oh, like It's gotcha. like, oh, that's the couch we sit on and watch TV. <laughs> Don't have This sex is here. the couch you can have sex on. <laughs> or like this other... I Once I watched oh, this other scene... <laughs> It's I'm okay. a snorter. It's so I cute. There was this other scene that I watched, and it was an oil scene. And I know the location owners don't allow you to use oil there because mm-hmm. they just put sandstone in outside. Yeah, don't use oil and, on sandstone. Yeah, and I saw this, and she's like pouring oil all over herself. Like, like, no! Oh, my God, you're ruining their floor. They're going to kill you when they find oh, out. And it's so hard to get oil out of sandstone. That didn't come out. No, I know. It you didn't literally, come out. Like, there's the when only- I went back and I saw them, they were like, oh, I'm mm-hmm. like, I saw the video. I'm so. <laughs> At that point, all you can do is pour oil over all the sandstone. Yeah, and just make it all. Yeah, which yeah. is not great. No, no. Anyway, so my gay interior design gene is coming through. So <laughs> I apologize. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, no, in, uh, porn is definitely interesting. When I joined kink.com and they'd, um, uh, and I was putting together like a sexual health board of mm-hmm. like, okay, you know, cause, just like any other industry, just like any other community, there are people that um, that need to know where the next AA meeting is, or the mm-hmm. next uh, uh, Crystal Meth Anonymous meeting mm-hmm. is, or like where is the next hospital? Like if you need something or otherwise. So I was putting together this big old board, and uh, some of the directors were like, "Come visit our set," and I was like, "Oh my god, I get to see a King dot com set. That is so awesome!" And then I went there, and it was like, "Oh, here's the paperwork. This is what you need to sign. You need to negotiate this and this and this with everybody. You need to have a very clear conversation." And like, is every Everybody comfortable with watching with Eric watching, and I was like, "Oh, this kind of just ruined the mood." But it was incredible because yeah. I was like, "Oh, those are all the things that we as viewers don't get to see that right. actually happen behind the scenes." Right, which I thought was really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Now I want to ask you about mm. uh, the recent victory ruling with the twenty two fifty seven rule. Can you explain it? Because a lot of people have no idea what twenty two fifty seven, and even in the industry. The only comprehension that people have with 2257 is that that's the part of the paperwork that they have to fill out where mm-hmm. models put in that they're of legal age mm-hmm. and all their identifying information to prove that they're of legal age. Yeah. So we know it has something to do with age requirements. And then I remember back um, when you know we used to have a lot of foreign performers come over and shoot over here. And then there was this 2257 ruling, which basically eliminated that. So if you didn't have a U.S.-issued government ID, uh-huh. we could not shoot you uh-huh. out here. And it had something to do with trying to prevent sex trafficking, which uh-huh. didn't seem to make any sense. So there's different laws that all fall into that conversation. There's the Mann Act. Um, there's the problem that uh, trafficking is defined five different ways in U.S. law, Mm -hmm. just because U.S. law has been evolving so much, and it's kind of like, which area does this apply to? So how do we need to define it? But just sticking uh, to 2257, so 2257, obviously I can't give anybody legal advice. I'm not giving legal advice. I'm just going to do the best of summarizing in my little little, uh, gay words uh, what it it all (laughs) means. Um, So uh, so 2257, yes, as you said, is rightly sort of referred to as age verification Mm -hmm. for the workers, for the performers. Um, uh, the whole story started somewhere along the 80s. Um, there were obscenity cases filed against the industry. I'm sure that your parents were oh, sort yeah. of well aware yeah. um, of the whole obscenity prosecutions and otherwise. So at some point, all of that fell flat because they couldn't get through. Um, <clears throat> because largely, what is, like, what is obscene? It's all it's well, very uh, and it's like, community uh, standards. So yeah, it's like it's it very, changes. Right, right, right. So so the FSC did an incredible job back then already fighting uh, for producers. And and uh, and performers alike, and sort of protecting their rights to produce adult content, and it's now protected constitutionally in California and in New Hampshire. But more importantly, so two two five seven was sort of. Um, do you remember Tracy Lords? Oh, are you kidding me? Yeah. So you, you don't know my Tracy Lords story. No. Oh, I have a Tracy Lords story. About it? Yeah. Am I allowed to know about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked about it with my parents. So my mom shot Tracy. So for those of you who don't know, Tracy Lords was a very big porn star. <clears throat> Turned out she was underage. People didn't know. My mom shot more content on her than almost anybody. Mm -hmm. She was actually like a friend of my mom's. Um, She came to like my birthday parties when I was a little girl. So I knew her as very, very young. And when it came out that she was underage, my parents flipped out because they had so much content of her and obviously they didn't know she was underage. And um, so they actually went, took all these slides and in a panic, drove around LA dumping them in different dumpsters and behind <laughs> grocery stores, like underneath like trash. And I remember my parents sat me down and I was maybe, I don't know, like seven or something like that. And they said to me, they go, look, um, cause they thought the cops were going to come and take them away to jail, you know, and like they normally show up early in the morning when you're in bed. Yeah. So they were like, if, the cops come and take mommy and daddy away to jail. We need you to take care of your little brother. And here are some phone numbers that you need to call. And I remember being so like, I'm seven. (laughs) Yeah. And I was so confused. I was like, I don't understand. Cause they couldn't obviously really explain to me what was going on. And I was like, why would mommy and daddy go to jail? Like who's, you know what I mean? Like I, it was so confusing to me and I remember that very, very well. Yeah. So yeah, Tracy Lawrence had a big effect on my family. 
That's interesting. Wow, I did not know that. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Mm-hmm. So, um, so part of what happened then is that basically legislators decided, oh my God, there's this massive epidemic of underage workers in the adult industry, which is really just not the case. Yeah. Um, and obviously, in Tracy Lord's case, she had a specifically faked ID. So even when I did, like, even though IDs were checked, um, she was walking around with a fake ID. So how yeah, would people I think know? She got um, what was it like her cousin's <clears throat> or something's birth certificate, and then used that to get an something actual like ID issued from like the uh, California DMV or something like that. Yeah, so like the ID itself was real, but the information on was, it was fake. Yeah. And it was falsified by her. Yeah. So so and and so what happened is that the legislature or the government basically decided, oh my God, this is this is the big story. We need to focus on this. We need to spend millions of dollars on regulating this industry to prevent this. Long story short, so the FSC has been fighting these lawsuits. Um, we started, uh, I think, a first iteration happened sort of um, through Joel Kaminsky, Good Vibrations uh, family. They had a first iteration of it. Then the FSC took it over. There were a couple industry companies that all sued individually. Long story short, fast forward, um, we are uh, we are now in a place where we have scored major victories against it. So for one, there was a big victory around, um, and this is why most people don't know about it in the industry anymore, is because of the way that FSC has been uh, very successful in legally advocating against 2257, the FBI actually stopped investigating it and mm-hmm. stop cho- sort of randomly showing up at people's yeah, doors without warrants. because they would do that. They would show up <clears> randomly <throat> at your office and yeah. demand um, that you show them all the paperwork on all exactly. of the models that so you've and, ever and the FSC basically got that to stop, um, which most people don't know because our industry has this interesting cycle of like two to five years and then people like come in phase out and there's very few people that stay long term so there's yeah. very few people that remember that entire history yes. and uh, so anyway so we got that to stop and then um, we were fighting in the third circuit uh, on several levels we won first one on the fourth amendment which is basically in regards to the unwarranted searches and and other things and mm-hmm. so and so what the courts decided on is that there was supposed to be something called strict scrutiny on when a judge tries to sort of uh, issue a search warrant or something. And that's a very high legal bar. It basically means that the body that is investigating, like the FBI, already has all the information that very clearly says this person is underage. This is why we need to go in, check that they have the records, and then basically enforce. So FSC won a really big victory on that, and that's final. Um, What we're now fighting is the First Amendment right, because it's an undue burden towards our industry to require us to do specific additional steps in record keeping when in in any other industry you pull up an ID, you look at the ID, you say, yes, this says you're over 18, so you're good. Um, uh, and in our industry, it's this big, gigantic deal um, and with separate records and how they need to be filed and where they need to be filed. And so we've been fighting on First Amendment grounds. And we won um, uh, in the sort of the first step. So uh, Judge Bailson ruled in favor of us um, or in favor of our arguments. Um, but <clears throat> But now the government has appealed that decision. So it's going back to the Third Circuit. Long story short, um, FSC has been fighting this for a good 10 years. Um, we've spent probably about a million dollars on it. We owe, I think, somewhere around $165,000 on the lawsuit right now, and it continues to rack up. So that's why it's important to sort of support the FSC as an individual, as a company, because there is so much... Yes, it probably do, you don't feel like it applies anymore. But if we lose, it sets a terrible precedent for any laws that have come in the future, and it's really hard to translate that. Oftentimes, um, what's really interesting about it is so giving you a little bit of nerd brain wisdom. So um, one appeal or one lawsuit was lost in what's called the Ninth Circuit, right. and then our lawsuit is in the Third Circuit, which is where we're winning. So now, what's interesting is. If we now win in the third circuit, does that mean that we have a split? So we have one circuit that says yeah, no and the other one that says yes. Does that mean we'll end up in the Supreme Court? Mm. Um, and if we end up in the Supreme Court, it'll be the second time that, that an FSC lawsuit ends up in the Supreme Court. And the first one we obviously won. Um, so, uh, so it's, so it's, 
interesting. It's a space to watch. Um, it's a big investment by the FSC. Um, there's a lot of things that we would love to do and get done for the industry, but simply because we have this gigantic legacy battle, mm-hmm. it holds us back with a lot of our resources of investing into other projects, which is unfortunate but also important. Right. So it's that weird balance that we have to strike. Where can people go? But, and we'll plug this again at the end of the podcast. Mm. But where can people go to donate to the FSC? <clears throat> so um, you can become, uh, you can either donate, which is uh, under freespeechcoalition.com. There's a tab that's called membership. Mm-hmm. Just click on that and you can make a donation. Or you can just join as a recurring member. We also just introduced um, uh, a great new benefits program for individuals, which is called NextGen. So people actually now have access to Teladoc Health, have access to legal services, and everything else all rolled into their membership. So mm-hmm. if you pay... 10, 15, 20, or $25 a month, you get a whole slew of individual benefits uh, uh, added to it. It's not insurance, but it's an incredible benefits package. Because mm-hmm. one of the things that FSC has recognized um, since I joined uh, three years ago is that we see a lot of performers that either don't have health insurance. Mm-hmm. And so any access to healthcare is good. They travel a lot, so a lot of HMO insurances only cover you when you're home and local. Right. But performers will end up in New York, they'll be in Florida, they, they'll yeah. travel all over. So what do you do with your HMO doctor? Right. You still go to the ER, you still spend $100, $500 on paying the ER, and then you might end up with additional bills afterwards. Right. So what we wanted to make sure is that people had a place where they could basically FaceTime a doctor and say, this is what I'm feeling, can you issue me a prescription? And they say yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing that we get a lot is performers the way that our industry is discriminated against is not just on the political level but landlords um, mainstream jobs so if they have a secondary banks. job banks huge problem yep. recurring yeah people get um, their accounts shut down when yeah. people find out that you're an adult performer and the problem is, is that banks are private institutions mm-hmm. so they can do what they want because I that they are regulated by the government right and there's interesting things happening with that too yeah um, which we can talk about but um, next gen also includes legal services which means like if you have a problem and that's 90% of the calls that we get from performers is I have an issue I need an attorney where do I go mm-hmm. and the first step is always that any attorney that they could talk to could give them some sort of understanding of whether this is a legal situation or not. So that's all included within the membership benefits as well. So support FSC and FSC supports you. Okay, I want to talk about the Inspire program. <clears throat> yes. So Inspire, uh, so Susie Q used to work for us. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, she started doing social media for us uh, uh, during Hello Show um, because she's she's a great wizardress of uh, social media. And uh, so uh, one of the things that when Susie was working with me, what we came up with is, you know, we have so many people that new, come new into the industry all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, how do we share knowledge? Right. Because we don't all need to reinvent the wheel. Like mm-hmm. we should all know, okay, when you get a paycheck, take 50% of that, put it into savings because you're going to have to pay taxes at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, so hold your money back. Don't go and buy. I mean, I can't tell you how many letters I get from the IRS about mm-hmm. perform- putting liens on performers because they don't pay their taxes. Which I mean, is all the time. Which is so sad because yeah. it's like, okay, you make money, count on 50% of that disappearing. If it's less than that, Awesome. Yeah. Then you have a savings account, literally. And having savings is really important, mm-hmm. especially in crazy, insane times as we live. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, so wait, where did I start off with this? We, you were talking about Inspire. Inspire. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> I was like, taxes, taxes, so much taxes and so many taxes. <laughs> Anyways, so what we wanted to do is like, okay, so how do we, how do we, where do we share that knowledge? Where do we share what it means to be an adult performer? Because so many people come in and they see, oh, I can make a thousand dollars here just by like having sex on camera. That's awesome. Let me go do that. What they don't realize is that somebody will always find your face. Somebody will find your name. Somebody will figure out who you are, where you live. And part of that was also what we explained during Proposition 60, sort of the discrimination, but also sort of the obsessive fans that our performers sometimes Mm -hmm. can can get. And fans are amazing, but also performers need a private life. They need balance. They need some space to recuperate, recharge, so that they can give great performances. So anyways, um, so, uh, so we wanted a 
place where we could communicate in all of that. And so we said, okay, so we need an industry newcomer support program. And we're like, INSP, that sounds really stupid. And then we were thinking, we were, I think we were walking to lunch or something, and we were both thinking about, like, what could we call it? So we came up with Inspire, mm-hmm. because it's, it, it really is, it's supposed to be an inspiration. And so um, Lotus, um, Lotus Lane uh, joined us uh, end of last year. Mm-hmm. She's this incredible queer black uh, performer that um, I've, I've loved and adored for the longest time. And so she's been talking with performers and getting it all put together. And so we're just about to launch the first page that is specifically for new performers. Um, then we'll have one that is for seasoned performers, for producers. Oh, so you want to be a producer in the adult industry because you think that's all glamorous and great? Here's the fact. Uh. And so, <laughs> I know. And so, so. I got a couple of things I can say. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So as we just learned, right? Yeah. So what we wanted to do is basically it's supposed to be a knowledge sharing tool for mm-hmm. people that are interested in working in the industry, but also in parts for people that are interested in learning about the industry. Mm-hmm. Because there is there are so many misconceptions about mm-hmm. the industry. And so we felt that if we had a public program that even journalists could access and sort of read through mm-hmm. so that they could better understand the life of an adult performer, better mm-hmm. understand the life of a producer, a talent agent. And then we're building the same thing also for the pleasure products industry because FSC obviously doesn't just represent adult entertainment but also sex toys. Mm-hmm. So we we cover all the fun bits. Um, and uh, uh, so we're also doing that because a lot of people don't know about all the regulations that uh, sex toys are under. Different product testing regulations, product safety regulations, how they vary between the EU and the US. I mean, that's that's a whole nother podcast about yeah. sex toys. But um, so, so basically what Inspire is supposed to be is really a knowledge sharing platform that'll expand and grow and hopefully be fabulous. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a big need for new performers to mm-hmm. learn about the industry because they just come in and, they're, and you know, a lot of times their agents won't tell them what's going on because... Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, it's not in their best interest. You yeah. know, they just and they and they recognize that a lot of these girls come in and they go as soon as they as they come in. So they, I think, you know, some of them feel like it's a waste of time to mm-hmm. like explain to them. You yeah. know, so, and then also too, some people just don't want to listen. Yeah, and it's then it's interested. when we talk about agents, it's important that um, if you're looking for an agent, always take a licensed agent. Yeah. So agent talent agencies. Um, are required by law to be licensed, which means that they have a bond, they have insurance. If something happens, there are specific regulations that cover them. So it's really important that you check that your talent agent has a real license. And part of the Inspire program will talk about that too. Interesting. Um, okay, I want to talk also about Ooh. consent in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, all the fun topics. I love how excited you are about all of this. I mean, I some of this. this, I feel like, the, I mean, you're such a wealth of information, and you must have to deal with so many different topics all the time. Like, does your brain just ever explode? Um, no. So they legalize pot in the California, ah. <laughs> and so it makes for really good sleeps. <laughs> no, so it's uh, it's interesting. It's um, the biggest challenge that FSC really has is the strap of resources because there are so many things that we know, mm-hmm. we see them, we want to fix them, mm-hmm. but we kind of and I'm the worst of this. I'm kind of um, I'm kind of like a little puppy that's like, ooh, squirrel, shiny things, ooh. <laughs> so I like you know, and uh, so my team and I were really good in sort of keeping each other streamlined, and we're like, okay. Okay, so this is the next topic that we're focusing on. This is like this is the idea pot. This is what we can draw from if we ever end up not having something to do, which never happens. Yeah. Um, and then, like you know, we're just trying to make progress. So consent is this other thing that people don't so don't talk about. So as I said, I grew up in East Germany. Actually, funny enough, one of the things that we learned in, in school in high school under sexual health was how to negotiate with your partner what you're interested in or what you want to do or sort of like how your sexual health is going to work while you're having sex, et cetera. So it's consent. That you guys learned in school. Yeah. Like yeah, in high school. Yeah. It's like instead of debate class, mm-hmm. we had how to communicate with each other on a respectful and sort of, you know, compromising level. So instead of just we're so fucking behind in this country, it's a little interesting. I mean, coming from because you know my parent, my mom's English and and my dad's South African, so I also come. So from you a, had a lot of cup of teas. <laughs> yes, yes, they're very big. That. They're very big on tea. Um, but you know, I come from a background that that does see this discrepancies between like American culture mm-hmm. and you know European culture and 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 sex specifically. So mm-hmm. when you came here from Germany, and especially now that you're working in you know it was pretty a much shock. The, yeah, I was going to say the American sex industry. Total are you just shock. like 
uh, what the fuck is wrong? It was with a people? total shock, and I mean that's <laughs> that's part of why I ended up becoming uh, Mr. L.A. Lover mm. because. Um, I was so dumbfounded by the conversations that I would have with potential sexual partners. Mm. Where, um, so I grew up, uh, like when I was 14, I knew what HIV was. I knew how it was transmitted. I knew how it was prevented. Um, back then, we were almost ready to know that when somebody takes medication, it can't be transmitted onwards, et cetera, et cetera. So when I came to the United States, I was like, why are we talking more about herpes, which is a skin-to-skin transmissible disease, than HIV? Mm-hmm. And why are we equating the two when they're completely different? Mm. And so there were a lot of shock moments that I faced when we were talking about sexual health. And that was largely why I also ended up in porn, because I was like, there is literally no better place to talk about sex mm-hmm. than in the porn industry or in the adult film industry. I so, have a question for you just yeah. real quick about herpes. You have um, a question for me? That's so rare. I know, right? <laughs> I Clearly, I've been... And providing all the information like, on this podcast. <laughs> um, so can you, since herpes is skin to skin, mm-hmm. is it possible to transmit it even when you're wearing a condom? Yeah. Okay. So herpes, like anybody that has ever had a cold sore has herpes. Yeah, but that's herpes simplex one, correct? However, yes. Because so in, it's... It's up here yes. for the people that can see us. Yeah. Um, but so what's really interesting about it is so everybody has always assumed that there's... so. Sorry, start over. So there's herpes we mm-hmm. refer to. Herpes is called herpes simplex virus. Mm-hmm. Herpes is categorized into two different categories, which is basically herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2, which is HSV1 and HSV2 for short. Um, now, what is always talked about is that HSV2 is the one that causes genital herpes, well, herpes 1 can cause that too. Mm-hmm. Um, it all depends on your body. It depends on your immune system. There's a lot of research that's happening around herpes. 90% of the American population has herpes. So 90%. 90% of the American population has herpes. So the prevalence of herpes is so great. Right. Um, there is no vaccine against it, and it's skin-to-skin transmissible. So there is just... The freak out about it is a little bit misplaced. Mm-hmm. It's important to know about. It's important to pay attention to. But it's also a question of like, can we even test for it? And when can we test for it? Is it always detectable? Or are there times when your test wouldn't even pick up that you have a herpes infection? And if we wanted to, as an industry, for example, rule out people from working in the industry that have herpes or carry the virus, mm-hmm. then we would probably rule out 90% of the people in the industry. So it's a, it's, it's an important conversation to have. I would never want to say that, n- that an STI is not important. However, like. It's one of those, tr- I'm so glad you brought that up because that is one of the <clears throat> things that isn't tested for. Yeah. Um, and I think that what you're saying is that, well, pretty much everybody has it and it mm-hmm. sounds like it's really tricky to test for. So can, do you know, can you test for, if you not have a flare up, can you test for it and so, it yes. show up you, or like, how does that work? So you can test for it. It could be that it doesn't show up. Sim- okay. Similar to HPV, mm-hmm. um, human papilloma virus, which is actually, here's a total plug. Um, the uh, So that we have a new vaccine vaccine against HPV, it's totally safe. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a new vaccine that's called Gardasil 9. It vaccinates against the top nine dangerous strains of HPV. There's like over 100, so okay. we're not going to go through those. But HPV is also a uh, skin-to-skin transmissible disease. Of course, as standard, the boys usually carry it, but the women have these have the effects, and that's where it really builds out. It can cause cancer. Um, for boys, it usually causes cancer in the throat. For women, it can cause cervical cancer. Um, not always, very rare. There's a small number of people that actually get cancer from it, but um, the FDA just approved this new vaccination and also approved it for use up to the age of 45. Mm-hmm. So until recently, it was sort of, I think it was limited on 26 years old. So yeah, if, that's what I heard. They wouldn't vaccinate you if you're a No, name. because you've already had sex, so you already have it. And then at some point, the FDA was like, well, just because you could have one strain doesn't mean you have all of them. Yeah. And then they figured out that um, even if you have one strain, you take the vaccination, it still prevents the other strains mm-hmm. as well as probably prevents the first strain that you might have already had from actually breaking out. Mm-hmm. So I'm literally in the process of getting my HPV vaccinations because I'm 32 mm-hmm. um, and uh, I never had them. Mm-hmm. Um, that's actually the one thing that we didn't talk about in German high school. Mm-hmm. Um, HPV was the thing that I did not know about. That's the one thing I learned that's about very, in the US. That's pretty new though, It's right? very specific and I, I don't know if it's new. I just felt like it's it was more talked about It's only come on the public here. radar recently. 
Possibly. Possibly. It, yeah, I'd never heard about Possibly. it. Possibly. So know. HPV vaccinations are awesome. They're covered by your health insurance. As long as we still cover pre-existing conditions, we will also <laughs> cover preventatives. So yay. For the listeners that are live right now, tomorrow is voting. So please go vote for everybody that is listening uh, to the recording at a later date when it's released. Then uh, thank you for voting. <laughs> I'll just say that. Sorry. <clears throat> Shameless plug. But we started off at consent. Mm-hmm. So consent is important. And um, uh, so because there is a lot of people that come into the industry that have either never received sexual health education in school, have not received that training that I referred to when I was younger uh, and back in German high school. Um, and uh, so negotiating consent is really important with your partner, whether it's you're on a date, whether you're in porn, whether you're in the general public. Like mm-hmm. consent is always important. It's kind of for everybody that remembers dirty dancing, mm-hmm. my dance area, your dance area, mm-hmm. and then you negotiate. It's sort of like which dance area do we want to engage in. So <clears throat> what we see a lot in the industry is that people make assumptions um, that somebody has understood what they're required to do mm-hmm. or what they're asked to do or what they're what they're getting themselves into or they misunderstand what the person was comfortable with or what they not what we were not comfortable with. Um, sometimes we see that uh, consent is violated because people don't understand everything that should be just talked about. Right. And so um, we actually brought um, a master's in social work on board, uh, Scarlett Sin. She also joined us at the end of last year, and we've been working for over six months to uh, build a catalog of questions and look into different technological options on how to deploy this to the industry. So we're kind of at the... um, we're kind of at the point where we're about to launch, but we're still doing fine tuning. And so, what we wanted to build is basically a standardized um, uh, list of like, here's all the things you should talk about. And you, as yourself, if you were about to perform, you can go through that list and say, okay, so I'm interested in doing this. I'm not interested in doing this. This is what I have experience with. This, this is what I don't. Something that's been big in the kink community for a long time. <clears throat> so this kind standard. of conversation. Because I remember I had a relationship with the Dom once. Ooh. Ooh, yes, that go? it was very fun. Was it Fifty Shades in the Good Way? Yes, yes, <laughs> I it love was. It. Um, it was definitely an educational experience. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but I remember he gave me he gave me a checklist, and you're like, "What?" And I was like, "What's going on here?" <laughs> but it was it was to be fair, it was the most I've ever communicated with anybody about mm-hmm. sex. I had never really like laid it all out there mm-hmm. on the table, and it was great because it really set the stage for a safe and comfortable environment when we decided to engage in sexual activities because I knew exactly you know what was coming and he knew you know what my limits were and yeah. we didn't have to like you know interrupt the play and be like wait a minute I don't like that yeah yeah nobody wants to do that like when you're in the moment it's awkward well and when you have sex you're so intimate you're so vulnerable with each other that you don't want to have that sort of level of uncertainty right and so um, so for a lot of performers or or other individuals that come into the industry what we wanted to give them is A a standardized way of talking about it even though it's going to be long Mm -hmm. Um, but it'll it'll open your mind towards all the things that are kind of out there um, and then you, you're you free to make your own choices but on the other side also it's sort of an educational tool mm. of like here's good things to talk about, here's what you should think about, you know, maybe take a step back because we also, and we're going to incorporate it into the Inspire program because we also wanted to highlight to people that come new into the industry of like what the wealth of things that are out there are Mm -hmm. and that they are also in charge of controlling whether they want that or not. Yeah, and educating new performers on the fact that they can't say no because I know a lot of girls come in, they go on set, they don't really know what's expected of Mm -hmm. them, their agent maybe didn't communicate it to them or or whatever the case may be, and then they kind of get pushed into doing a scene that they don't want to do. And they, they don't feel like they can say no because they're young and they're, you know, I've heard a lot of times girls say, I was the only girl on set. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, you know, and if I said no and I wouldn't do this, then they couldn't do the scene because maybe that was specifically what the scene was supposed to be about. And then ever, no one's going to get paid and everyone's going to get home and people are going to hate me. And then um, people are going to complain that I'm difficult and I'm not going to get any more yeah. work. You just get like into this really awkward situation. Yeah. And that's played out in a couple of scenarios lately, um, just this year. Mm-hmm. In the industry, which has you know provoked a lot of intense conversation. Well, and I think that that's the other part that I um, that I work really hard on for the industry is that we should all understand that we're human beings. Mm-hmm. Um, we all have 
different days. We all have different moments in our lives when we're on our top of our game, when we're not on the top of our game. Mm-hmm. And we all have different experiences and baggage that we carry around. So sometimes it's it, it's just so important that we have good communication, that we respect each other. We can agree to disagree. We can say, I don't like this, and that's great, and then walk away. Um, we don't we don't all have to sort of go around bashing each other's heads over everything every day. Mm-hmm. And so what I what I love during Prop 60 was that coming together and mm-hmm. was that laying our differences aside, you know, the mm-hmm. gay industry, the straight industry. So we'll get into that. Um, they Everybody worked together and everybody was in such great unity that we were able to create this incredible victory for ourselves mm-hmm. together. And so um, my, my favorite hashtag is always united we stand mm-hmm. because divided we fall. Mm-hmm. And, um, and for so long we've like allowed our own internal divisions to like make us an even smaller group. Like there's, mm-hmm. there's the 50 queer people over here and then there's like the big straight industry and then there's like the awkward gay industry and then mm-hmm. there's... So And instead of saying, hey, we all do sex for money, we are all in the stigma together, we all receive the same bullshit every day from banks, from educational institutions, from the government, um, from wherever you turn – we can all work together in fixing this. I yeah. always hate when people just drive wedges into it, and that always makes me really sad. Have you seen the adult industry kind of fracture lately? <clears throat> because I feel like I feel like I've seen both ends. I've seen mm-hmm. a lot of fracturing going on. You know, there's been a lot of deaths and suicide in the industry, which you know has caused a lot of heated contention and has been really painful for a lot of people. Um, and then you know, different accusations of you know misconduct on set, uh, sexual harassment, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But then I've also seen you know people coming in and you know on social media. You know what I really liked is the way that like the the new the words the sex worker word is kind of like new in the vernacular mm-hmm. of the adult industry. And you know before it was always like it was porn stars, then it was hookers, then it was like cam girls, yeah. and it was like they were all different things. And there was a lot of you know porn people saying like oh she's a hooker I don't want to work with her and there was mm-hmm. like and now I just see like you know there's an attempt of people to really bring people together like saying look shaming other sex workers doesn't you know help the all of us because mm-hmm. all of us we are all sex workers it doesn't really matter in which you know, precise, um, you know, cubby hole you want to put yourself in, but we're all sex workers and we should all come together. And that's, that's something new that, that I've seen, which is really great. So it's yeah. like, it's interesting. You see like kind of both sides. There's a little bit of a shift going on. And, and so a lot of the things that you just spoke about from, uh, from suicides to bullying to sexual abuse and harassment, a lot of those things we, we see very clearly. And that, mm-hmm. that's what dictates a lot of our work. When we see an issue, we try and figure out ways of solving it, preventing it from happening again, mm-hmm. but also providing services to the people that had that lift experience mm-hmm. in order to try and stabilize them, in order to help, in order to do whatever we can. So we've built, We've built a long network around that. But um, I think uh, so seeing yourself as a community that has something in common is much more powerful than seeing yourselves as individual groups that don't have anything in common. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I love the term sex worker because I think that it's an incredibly valuable and empowering one. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it I think it speaks lengths to understand yourself as somebody that does that. Um, uh, and it creates a sense of um, empathy and understanding of one another because we do know that um, we have a lot of performers that don't just perform in front of the camera. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the stigma that is levied against sex workers in the United States is also also just terrifying. Mm-hmm. We're not we're not and it's not helping anybody. It's not making it go away. Mm-hmm. And what it actually does is it pushes more people into the shadow. It pushes more people uh, uh, into dangerous situations. Um a lot of your listeners will probably have heard that FOSTA SESTA was signed into law by President Trump in April. Um that has that has destroyed safe havens for or or safe places for for sex workers to negotiate with clients to understand whether a client is safe. Um that has remove them from a safe environment that was filtered through the internet um, and put them back onto the street where they're not safe. Mm-hmm. And so until we decriminalize sex work and until the government actually puts in efforts to um, provide services to sex workers, to provide outreach, to provide you know different things, I think everybody should take a step back and say, hold on, we're criminalizing a population which 
probably only increases the trafficking efforts that are out there. Right. So we should all take a step back and look at, okay, what can we actually do to be productive and not to just say words that will ring well in election years? So. Of like, I achieved this, right. and it doesn't really do anything. So I assume you support the legalization of prostitution. I support the decriminalization of sex work as a okay. first step. I think legalization is definitely a path that will be good in the future. Mm-hmm. I think before we make laws, which then implies legal before we make laws and regulations that regulate sex work, again, drawing back on our experience with Proposition 60 and other legal efforts or legislative efforts, we want to make sure that the people that try to make those rules understand the needs, understand the requirements, understand the nuances of what sex work is. Mm-hmm. Um, because those those can only be translated by people that have lived experiences. And what I feel very uh, enthused about is that we see legislators across the United States, not many, but but some stepping up to the game and saying, I hear you, I see you, and I think that what we've done as a government is not helpful, and I want to I sit down with you, learn your story, and understand how I can be of better service to you because I am a public servant. I'm an elected official that's supposed to be representing you, mm-hmm. and if I'm not, then I'm not doing my job. And I think a lot of this shift is happening on the national and the political stage. I think the last two years have really strongly highlighted where our com- where our country is faltering, um, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and where we put priorities into the wrong place. Should we really spend more money on discussing where people go pee, or should we figure out how people can sleep under a roof? Right. Um, should we figure out who can marry who, or should we figure out that our that uh, that our education system is well funded, that our healthcare system is easily accessible, right. that our lives are easily lived rather than just struggles of 14-hour jobs every day Mm -hmm. in order to just make that rent payment and then still have nothing to live for. That's not the American dream, or that's at least not what I moved here for, and that's never what I understood the United States to be. So I think we're seeing a lot of shifts in a lot of different ways. Um, The Women's March, uh, um, they had an internal struggle around sex work, of course, but there was a struggle. Mm -hmm. There was a conversation around it, and I think that that was incredibly valuable Mm -hmm. of sort of elevating Elevating, uh, elevating that to the top. And I, I wish if our industry saw itself more like a community that has so very much in common, mm-hmm. um, I think we could achieve a lot more a lot faster. Mm-hmm. Um, we see the porn as a public health crisis rhetoric, which we talked about right. briefly, which is nonsense. Um, there's a lot of shame also, too, attached to people who come into the industry because they feel shame by their family, by mm-hmm. their friends, obviously by the public. Well, and I think as a gay man, I can speak to some of that. Obviously, mm-hmm. that's not my lived experience, but um, I can I can speak to what that does when you lose your family over who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when you lose your community over who you are, when you suddenly feel like somebody that nobody cares about. Those are terrible terrifying things. And so I think that as an industry, as a community, we have that responsibility to together lift up each other. Right. Sorry, preachy soapbox. No, no, this is good. Monday mornings. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you hopeful for the future? Do you see a positive future for the adult industry? I think if I weren't hopeful for the future, I couldn't actually fight every day. Mm. So um, I'm I'm an eternal optimist with a very real, realistic pessimistic side. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. Um, I am hopeful. I think we're seeing a lot of great things. I think we're seeing the um, the uh, improvement of performers' lives through being less dependent um, on big production companies, being more independent now. That's a problem to FSC members, our corporate members, of course, our companies that actually fund us Mm -hmm. um, are getting smaller and smaller. Their revenue streams get smaller. So I'm worried about that at all times because I also worry about my team. I worry about the work that we do. But I think that the empowerment of performers is a great value to the industry. And what I love is we're seeing so many more companies pop up um, that really care tremendously much about performers. Mm -hmm. And so I think that... Um, I think that uh, uh, most of our FSC members are very much on board with all of that. And I think it's kind of a time where we will see the companies that um, treat each other well, that treat performers well, um, that are fair, equal, and communicative with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those will be the ones that continue to 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 strive, that will right. continue to grow. And then there's other companies that might rightfully fall off the list. I can't think of a single FSC member that would deserve that, but mm-hmm. um, but I think but I think there are 
you know, there are places, and we know that there are producers that we don't support or that we don't like. Right. Um, that there are places where we're like, oh, this is weird. Why Why do you act like this? Why do you pretend that you're not part of this industry? Right. right. Um, and we do have black sheep, just like any other industry, we would have black sheep. Right. Um, and so, uh, so I would hope that a lot of this changes. My biggest worry is honestly the division between the – and we wanted to talk about this. I don't know if we still have time between the uh, straight content side, so the content that is made for a straight identifying audience, mm-hmm. and the content that is made for a gay identifying audience. I think that I think that if we could bring those two industry groups closer together, and a lot of that revolves around HIV, um, then I think we would have a lot better time. Yeah, that's a whole other conversation. Because I, I know you have. Uh I mean, it's twelve fifteen. I have time. You have time. I'm good. Okay, I think we should we can, get to that. We can do a little bit more. Okay, we'll do a little bit more. A because, little bit more because there there is a huge divide between yeah. the straight industry and the adult industry. And myself working on the straight side, like there's so much I don't know about mm-hmm. the gay industry, and it's and only even recently our award ceremony started handing out like some awards to the gays and to the trans and like allowing them to come up on stage and accept like one award instead of just announcing a picture and right done. exactly so like they're kind of slowly trying to accept and integrate yeah. them into the straight mainstream porn industry but it's slow yeah so educate me <laughs> <laughs> give me things um so uh so We've talked a little bit about testing. We've talked a little bit about HIV. Right. So I'm going to try and tie some of these things in. Okay. And I'm sorry if I make everybody's ears bleed. That's okay. Um, you can always turn it off. <laughs> and that no pause and come back. Yes. Um, so uh, so the industry understands itself relatively clearly in the way that the industry protocols were built because they were built out of real community needs and mm-hmm. and sort of learned and lived experiences. So on the on the straight content side, so the content that's produced for a straight audience, um uh, we mostly use what is called the PASS system, which is based around the testing protocols, which require a 14 day test. So within, if you want to perform on the, on the, uh, on the, 14th of the month, you must have had a test on the first or second in order to still be eligible and to be cleared, if that makes sense. Yeah, actually, that's a good question because, okay, so if it's, uh, so what's today? Today is November 5th. So if my, you're going to make me do math. (laughs) Wait, so if my test expires on November Uh 5th, Mm -hmm. am I still okay to work that day? So, um, Ideally, you want to go and get a new test because your test is going to expire today. Right. Um, so, but as long as, and the easy answer to that question is actually log into the pass system. If you're still cleared in the pass system, you if you still have a green check, check mark, yes. you're still good to work today. Okay. If you have a red X, then you don't. Okay. And the reason why that answer is not simple is because um, the 14 day clock starts on the day when you when your specimens are drawn. Mm-hmm. So the industry uh, the industry protocols require testing for HIV, hepatitis. C, hepatitis B, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomoniasis. Okay. Those are the big seven that we require testing right. for. When you go in and get tested on the first, that's when your 14 days start ticking. And so on the 14th, your test is going to expire. Right. It's not when you get your results back, it's when your test is actually being done. Right. Um, the reason why so the, the past, window actually where you perform with the test is actually smaller than 14 days. Yeah. So it's 13, it's 12 to 13 days generally. So we require our, our participating labs to r- provide results back within 24 to 48 hours because otherwise it'd be really unfair to performers. Yeah. Um, so hmm? I've, sorry, I have just one more question yeah. because this is still technically sort of a voluntary thing. Mm-hmm. Like there's no law that makes you have to get tested. It's just that, you know, all of the big reputable uh, companies who don't want to be basically blacklisted by the rest of the industry follow this protocol. Now, when the 14-day test window was introduced and certain companies started um, adopting that as a mandate, such as MindGeek, there were Mm -hmm. other companies that were still okay with the 30-day testing window. Does that still exist? Does anybody still pa- follow the 30-day testing window or no? That's... I only know of one talent agency and one company that still works with 30 days. Interesting. Um, and that's against industry protocol. Um, okay. 
Yeah. Because the reason for that is, is that on that 14th slash 15th day, the risk of an HIV transmission ex- starts increasing exponentially. Right. So the risk is almost double on the 15th day mm-hmm. than it was on the 14th. So it's, um, and that's a lot of math and statistics, yeah. and I don't want to bore everybody to death, but there's medical reasons why we say 14 days. It was decided by infectious disease specialists, doctors. I'm not a doctor. I hold no degrees. I'm a high school, I'm a high school person. Um, <laughs> so you're welcome. So don't mistake me for any medical advice either. But, um, but, uh, uh, so there are professionals that have made those decisions. And actually, when we were at Cal OSHA, we were advocating for them. If they're doing a regulation, to please put our testing protocols into the regulation, right? Because it is so effective. We know that it's more effective than condoms because we haven't had an HIV onset transmission since two thousand and four, right? So there is a big thing, and the the twenty eight to fourteen day change actually happened in two thousand thirteen. So yes, in the beginning there was kind of like, a, oh, what? No, we're not going to do that. And then everybody realized that everybody was requiring it. Yeah. And so um, we also operate a subsidy fund to help performers pay for the test. Mm-hmm. Um, it really only comes down to about twenty dollars per test that we can subsidize, and the panels are expensive. But we try and help those that need help. Um, so for those that are interested in that, please also uh, sign up for that. Um, you can do that by emailing us info at freespeechcoalition.com. Um, and uh, so, so on the straight content side, um, we predominantly work with pass, mm-hmm. just because. Um, so the way that sex is perceived by a straight audience is predominantly condomless. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, also, we test predominantly on the on the straight side because it is the safer option for many people in the straight industry, and it's a great option. We also allow for condoms. So if people want to take condoms or use condoms, then that's obviously also a thing. Um, on the um, on the gay side. It's predominantly focused around condom usage because if you think back to Philadelphia, remember that movie? Yes. So that's when, yeah. So, so when I grew up and I was a little gay boy in a little village outside Berlin, um, behind the wall, um, and, uh, well, after the wall fell, I saw the movie and, um, I looked at that movie. I was like, this is how I'm going to die. I'm going to have to listen to some weird opera singer that I don't know, and I'm just going to die of AIDS. And so the gay, the gay community adopted condoms as the, like, as the status quo sexual health option, Mm -hmm. as it was the only way to prevent HIV. The straight side, you know, straight families that were predominantly monogamous, um, they were like, oh, you know, we've been married for like 30 years. We don't have sex with other people. She takes the pill. We don't need to use condoms. For gay men, that was a very different story. So in the gay porn industry, we've actually seen that um, they predominantly only rely on condoms right? Um, because they feel more comfortable with that. Also, part of that conversation, and this is where it becomes tricky and where I need people to open their minds towards a new or a more inclusive way of thinking, is there are people living with HIV. Mm-hmm. There are people in our industry that live with HIV. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and it's important that we create an environment where the person not living with HIV as well as the person living with HIV can be safe and um, and not harassed for whoever they are, whatever they choose, whatever they consent to. Mm-hmm. So our testing protocols, the PASS system currently does not allow for anybody that lives with HIV to be part of the protocol, right. which is partially why the gay industry doesn't use it mm-hmm. because there are a lot of gay performers that are HIV positive living with HIV. Mm-hmm. I myself, one of my partners is HIV positive. Mm-hmm. I'm on pre-exposure prophylaxis. He's on treatment. We've never used a condom. Everybody is fine. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just science. And so if we can get some of the 80s, 90s rhetoric of fear that was mm-hmm. pushed into us really hard. Yeah. And in the first years was really effective, but we didn't consider what the fallout of it would be 20, right. 30 years later. Right. If we can lay some of that aside, I think we could we could close that gap. So what we're trying to produce is so we're going to have the pass system and what we're thinking about is okay, so how can we bring testing as a standard to the gay industry without discriminating against people living with HIV? Cuz that's the big question. Right. 
And so there are different uh, different forms of HIV tests. Um, there is one that is called a viral load test. So instead of a qualitative, when you check, is there any HIV? There's a quantitative, which quant basically count. Um, you can count the number of how much HIV there is in the blood. Mm-hmm. Because we know that if you have less than 50 copies of HIV in a milliliter of blood, um, then you're counted as undetectable, which means that the virus can't infect somebody else. Right. So would it be beneficial, and this is a question that we ask ourselves, would it be beneficial to build a system around that protocol for people living with HIV so that they can also safely work within the industry without being discriminated against, without um, without uh, uh, being sort of cast out or otherwise. But the gay side of the industry has built a really good way of being inclusive and, and being communicative about it. Mm-hmm. And um, FSC sort of, I mean, I've only been there for three years, which sounds ridiculously long, but it's really not if you look at all the different fires that flame up every day. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're we're looking at okay. So where do we medically stand? How can we navigate this? We don't want to scare people into thinking that they're going to end up working with someone that they don't want to work with based on whatever reason, whether it's the HIV status or because of something else. Um, but simultaneously, we also don't want to cut all of them out. Mm-hmm. So it's just a question of how do we navigate that? How do we how do we uh, how do we improve it? How do we uh, levy better education, better knowledge to sort of reduce the stigma? Which is the same that exists in the general public. Mm -hmm. A straight couple that has never engaged with the LGBT community or HIV at large, they will have the same prejudices against HIV as they were talked about in the 80s and 90s. Right. Versus the gay uh, gay industry or the gay community where it's an ongoing standard conversation. Mm -hmm. Whenever I meet somebody, I'm like, hey, are you positive? Are you negative? I'm on prep. I'm cool. What's what's up? Let's have a right. conversation on the on the straight side. It's like, oh my god, no, we can't talk about that. Um, I mean, and there's so, even like some people that complain about <clears throat> like you know a certain uh, director HIV positive being on set and like interacting yeah. with the performers in any Which way is, whatsoever, y- like not having sex with yeah. them, but just. Touching, touching them and stuff yeah. like that. And there was a lot of fear around yeah. that. And so, you know, again, I think that nobody's fear should ever be um, dismissed. made dismissed. Mm. So um, all your feelings are valid. Right. Whatever you feel is absolutely valid. But maybe let me help you understand those feelings better. And maybe let me give you a couple of viewpoints. I'm not going to try and argue with you or convince you of anything. But I want to give you the full picture. And I think that that's where the United States as a society, as a culture, has completely failed itself. Mm. Is we're not allowing ourselves to see the whole picture. We're not allowing to ourselves to understand nuances. Yeah. We think of a box. Yeah. And if you don't fit in that box, then you don't fit in this country. And that's really unfortunate. And so sex workers, transgender individuals, queer individuals, um, a lot of people of color, they're all thrown out of that box because they don't fit in that American standard box. And Mm -hmm. so I just... Uh, I I want to take some of that box and just like shred it and let people sort of be more fluid and be more free and more communicative and sort of learn from each other and all the things. What I am very excited, and then I'll stop talking, um, <laughs> maybe, possibly, I don't know, you gave me a microphone, this is a dangerous situation. <laughs> um, what uh, what I'm really excited about is, so the PASS system was built in 2011 when right. AIM, which you probably still remember. Oh, I remember. I used was to like, their calendar, their yearly you calendar. Did? Yes. Oh, I you should do a PASS photos. calendar. We should. Can we do a vintage calendar too? Yeah. Like if you have like old photos. But we I do. Need, we I have need, all the pictures that oh I God, shot for AIM. Amazing. I have all of them still. That's amazing. I so, never throw anything that so I shoot So AIM out. was basically destroyed. Um, yes, I remember and, that. And so the industry was suddenly left without any safety protocols yes. because we all heavily relied on AIM. The production was very central in Los Angeles. For Everything those of you was, who don't know, AIM was the adult industry testing Yeah, the adult med- industry medical foundation right. or something along those lines. Headed by Sharon Mitchell, who yeah. was a uh, performer. Yeah. So, so and that was, that was sort of the first onset of testing, right? Right. And then, um, so when AIM was shut down, the FFC was sitting there, and my predecessor, Diane Duke, in 2011, were like, <gasps> what do we do? Mm-hmm. So they set out and did a really good, great, and quick job in creating what was then called APHSS, mm-hmm. which we later morphed into PASS because it's just not yeah. a good acronym for anything. Right. So, um, so it became PASS, and so PASS has evolved over time, but our website hasn't much. So if mm-hmm. you go on fscpass.com, you'll understand what PASS is. It totally works. If you're a performer, a producer, uh, a talent agent, you can log in, you can check the person by 
by their legal name or by an ID number in order to make sure that they're cleared, that they're compliant with the industry requirements, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not very pretty or informative. Mm. So um, what we've also been working on over the last year very strongly is um, we're building a complete new front end mm-hmm. to pass. So there will be sexual health education information. So you know a lot of the stuff that we just talked about in regards to HIV, herpes, et cetera, mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot. There's going to be a wealth of information. There's going to be information about how to access certain stuff. Like you, if you don't have a hepatitis A or hepatitis B vaccination, here's where you can go and get them. Mm-hmm. HPV vaccination, here's where you can go and get them. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis, HIV treatment, transgender health resources, healthcare linkage, etc. So we're building a really big resource site that is specifically focused on language that the adult that applies to the adult industry because, mm-hmm. like, you can find all of this stuff out there on the internet, but a lot of it doesn't talk to our community. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to do something that talks to our community and, and allows them to, to have it all in one place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, freespeechcoalition.com and fscpass.com are going to link back and forth a little bit on certain topics and issues. But our my goal was um, I think that the pass system is so incredibly valuable and we're we're building out some back-end features as well to make it easier to use like mobile friendliness, mm. which wasn't really a thing in 2011, I guess. Yeah. But it definitely has definitely been since now. 2011. Yes. So, <laughs> and uh, so there is a lot of things that we're working on, and we're really, really excited about because um, I think we can close a lot of the divides that I spoke about over the mm-hmm. last hour. We can close them by just filling them with knowledge yeah. and by filling them with understanding, and um, and then hopefully one day we'll all sit there and be like, "United, we stand." Yay. Eric, thank you so much. I've learned so much today and I'm supposed to know all of these things and I don't. I didn't, but now I do and I, I feel like so much better informed and I think um, all my listeners will too and I, hopefully they will understand the adult industry and the you know, kind of back end with everything that we're doing to try to protect the performers and the industry as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any like last words that you want to tell our listeners that they should... I don't know that you want them to take away from this, or maybe just plug all your <laughs> plug all your pluggables. Well, first, I want to thank you for your time and thank you for inviting me. And sorry for of being course. so difficult to schedule. <laughs> no, it's fine. You're a busy man. Anybody who knows LA knows that driving over the hill is kind of a very long journey. <laughs> yes. Um, so I want to thank you for that. And I think um, I don't want to plug anything more about FSC or the industry. I think um, anybody who's listening, I just, I just, uh, uh, I hope that some of what we talked about today will open up your hearts. And minds towards people that may be different, communities that are different, different lifestyles, different choices, and that um, hopefully we can all come together and sort of lay away some of our differences or value our differences instead of finding them destructive pieces of our lives. Mm. Um, and uh, instead of hating each other, just loving each other a little bit more. Because I think if we've learned anything about the last two years, we all need a lot more love. Yes, yes we do. So where can people go to, once again, I know you've already said this, but I just want to make sure that you drive this home. Where can people go to find out more about the Free Speech Coalition? Where can they donate? So um, follow us on Twitter at fscarmy uh, fscarmy.com. This is how bad a millennial I am. I don't <laughs> even understand Twitter. No, so follow us on Twitter at fscarmy. Uh, you can also follow the PASS system if you want to keep on track with health advisories or other things. So follow um, at FSC Pass. Um, and to learn more about FSC, the work that we do, just visit our website, www.freespeechcoalition.com. Com. Um, and if you want to learn more about FSC Pass or maybe take a peek when the new website's live, uh, go on fscpass.com. Um, and if you ever have any questions, our email addresses, our phone lines, um, they're all on the website. Um, and uh, I think everybody in my team, my staff, our volunteers, they'll all be more than happy to talk to anybody about just about anything. And then you have your own personal Twitter. As oh, well. I do. Yeah, it's Eric Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we were joking earlier that nobody could pronounce my last name. Rightly so. It's a great conversation starter. It's uh, E R I C P A U L L E U um, E with a little at symbol in the front. Perfect. And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Twitter and Instagram. Eric, thank you once again for coming in. This thank was you. Such a valuable conversation, and um, I'm so glad that we could finally make it happen. You're super welcome. What are we talking about next? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> 